Hello, everyone, and welcome to this latest webinar from IHS Market titled Broadband Evolution, CUPS, and 5G Convergence. Today, our panel will explore the opportunities and benefits of unified multi-access broadband as an enabler for a universal core, as well as the challenges and next steps ahead. Our webinar is co-presented by IHS Market Technology, now a part of Informatech, and our partners, Juniper Networks and Nokia. My name is Alan Tatara, Senior Event Manager for the IHS Market Technology Group webinar team, and I want to thank everyone for joining us. So before we begin, I want to highlight just some of the features that are available for you on the webinar. So the console that you're looking at, it is completely customizable. So this means you can open, close, move, or resize any of the windows that you have open on your screen and arrange the console as you wish. Now at the bottom of your console, you're going to see a number of application widgets. So make sure you check these out during the webinar. But I do want to call out the resource list widget. And this is where you will find additional material about our topic, including the downloadable slide deck from today's session, as well as other valuable information. And all these materials can be accessed and downloaded right from your console. You'll also see a Twitter widget, and this means you'll be able to tweet directly from the console. And today we are using the hashtag broadband. We will also have a live Q&A session directly after our presentation, so please remember to submit your questions or comments at any time by using that Q&A box that you see on the left side of your screen. Also note that this webinar is being recorded and that the on-demand version will be sent to you within 24 hours. Finally, if you experience any technical issues, just make sure you click on that question mark widget and you will get the answers that you need. So now let me introduce our panel. First leading our discussion is Heidi Adams. Heidi is Executive Director in the Network Infrastructure Research Segment at IHS Market Technology, now a part of Informatech. Joining Heidi is Paul LaChapelle. Paul is the Director of Product Line Management at Juniper Networks. And rounding out our panel, we have Sanjay Watwa. Sanjay is the Senior Director of Product Management at Nokia. So welcome to our panel. We are honored to have you with us today. So Heidi, let's get started with our presentation. So I will now turn the controls over to you. Thank you, Alan, and a warm welcome to everyone joining us for our webinar today. So over the next hour, we're going to explore one of the major architectural shifts that's currently underway that's going to have a significant impact on how both fixed and wireless networks are designed, how we're going to implement virtualized networking moving forward, and also how we can begin the move towards any access broadband services. So we're going to have a look at a few of the emerging opportunities the challenges ahead, and we're going to look at the key technology. In this case, it's CUPS, or Control User Plane Separation. So we'll have a look at that in a little bit more detail, and we're going to have a look at some of the key standards work that is currently underway to enable these new capabilities. We'll also have a closer look at some of the key use cases for CUPS. At the end of the session, as Alan mentioned, we will save some time for Q&A, so don't hesitate to answer or enter your questions into the Q&A interface. So we're going to start off with some of the higher level context before we drill into the details. Multiple applications, of course, driving the uh, evolution of telecom networks. So networks, as we all know, are continuing to grow and evolve to meet bandwidth demand, uh, to meet, we're seeing an increasing number of endpoints and more and more stringent latency requirements. All of this is being driven by multiple new and emerging applications. So if we look at those applications, first off, video. Video will continue to be a significant driver moving forward, and we can continue to anticipate that this is going to represent the vast majority of traffic volume moving forward. Um, as an example, Cisco's VNI index tracks video, tracks traffic. Um, they've indicated in their most recent report that internet video, video on demand, managed IP video is going to drive 75% of all IP traffic moving forward and will increase over time. If you look at 5G and IoT, um, this is not only going to drive more bandwidth, but also the need to accommodate a variety of different mobile and wireless applications, all with different requirements. 5G is also anticipated to be a key driver towards the introduction of virtualized networking and in particular the infrastructure required to support that transition. 
Next one on the list, digital transformation. At a really high level, this is a term we like to use for everything pertaining to an enterprise's shift towards cloud-centric and cloud-enabled applications, but also cloud-enabled services and networking. And this transition, of course, is going to have a huge impact on underlying network design and network architectures. And finally, cloud gaming and esports. Um, esports, kind of a new term that's arising. Really, that's about consuming this this idea of watching, <laughs> kind of a sport. Um, of course, esports. Um, this is more driving additional bandwidth. But if you look at cloud gaming, that has requirements for low latency bandwidth as well as potentially um, requirements for edge compute as well. So these are examples of what's driving the evolution of telecom networks. The question then becomes, what's happening in the network itself as a result of this? So new architectures are emerging, and our focus today is mostly on the residential edge, but also the mobile core by extension. So industry today is transitioning from purpose-built platforms for this functionality to architectures that leverage what I like to call a network fabric or a physical underlay, and then a layer of network services and applications that reside on top of that in the cloud, where the cloud in this case represents data center facilities um, that are in a range of locations with the ability to support different applications and different application requirements. So what is driving this change in network architecture? What are the key triggers for change? Well, um, from a recent survey that IHS Market conducted um, that included service provider network architects and CTO staff, some of the key drivers include 5G and the associated introduction of edge compute. So the implementation of virtualized infrastructure for 5G also provides an on-ramp and an opportunity to introduce um, additional network functions and services into the mix. Um, fixed wireless access and hybrid access type services also comes into the mix as a driver. We're also seeing a shift in the location of internet peering points, which traditionally have been deeper in the network, but are now starting to move up closer to the end customer. Also associated with this, content delivery, where that content, video content, is cached and located, that is also moving out closer to the customer. And finally, for cable network operators, the move and shift towards distributed access architectures is also having an impact. So all of this in together is driving change. There are a few things that are potentially preventing change, mostly around the business case for making this transition, um, and also the there is you know, a five-ish year type refresh cycle on the equipment that's involved in the residential edge or mobile core, but we're starting to see that change is happening and this is moving forward. So to put a few numbers around that, um, CUPS, this is the key term for today, big focus of the webinar. It's really emerging as a preferred evolution path for the residential service edge and for the mobile core moving forward. So CUPS or control user plane separation, um, we're starting to see, well, increasing interest in the industry for sure. Um, but we're also starting to see proof of concepts, early trials, and a few early deployments leveraging this technology approach to this piece of the network. At IHS Market, we're anticipating that this is going to see much broader adoption moving into 2020, 2021, and beyond, and that is somewhat in lockstep with the adoption of 5G infrastructure buildouts. So what is CUPS? What are the opportunities that this is enabling? Why is this so interesting? What are the challenges ahead? So this is the meat of our webinar today. And let's move into the next section of our presentation to explore this in a little bit more detail. And I'll ask Paul to kick us off. Paul? Thank you, Heidi. Um, <clears throat> I'll start out with these uh, few next slides which cover some of the challenges associated with network convergence and transformation. Um, so some of the service providers today, obviously, they're challenged with uh, keeping pace with consumer demand as well as infrastructure investments to address, you know, the ever-increasing bandwidth uh, growth that's happening on their infrastructure. This bandwidth growth is um, triggered primarily by um, video consumption. Uh, Heidi mentioned, you know, the statistics from Cisco CNI around um, the volume, maybe some percent of mobile traffic um, will be going over over the network. So this is uh, a, um, an inflection point that um, 
the service providers are considering seriously. So <clears throat> essentially, um, infrastructure capacity upgrades that are being implemented by uh, service providers today are pretty much a cost of doing business. So in order to remain competitive, um, they need to continue to upgrade their infrastructure and, you know, the the revenues uh, may not always be commensurate with the cost of making those upgrades. So as a result, service providers are looking for new ways to design, build, and operate their networks, trying to achieve lowest total cost of ownership and maximum agility to roll out services. <clears throat> So um, all this is triggering kind of new network transformation um, that's happening, uh, introducing combinations of uh, both new technologies as well as new architectures. So these include network function virtualization and cloud and applying cloud principles and operations to the network as well as uh, new technologies like CUPS, Control User Point Separation, which we'll cover in detail today, as well as, um, you know, maybe hosting workloads um, in, um, via a, a telco cloud infrastructure and introducing distributed fabrics in distributed CO locations with edge compute um, closer to the subscriber for um, a better experience. So cloud and specifically the economics introduced with cloud-based operations have become a key ingredient to service provider transformation um, and adds increased agility, flexibility, and automation. <clears throat> One of the most uh, significant considerations being considered as part of um, service provider transformation is forward-looking uh, convergence of wireline and wireless networks. Service provider networks will <clears throat> evolve and be redesigned with an eye towards a fully converged network for their fixed and mobile networks and are expecting to reap the benefits of a new 5G mobile core moving forward. Okay, so looking at, um, you know, convergence a bit and um, new architectures, you know, a common infrastructure and new network architectures brings its own set of new challenges. So not all services that are running over the network are created equal. And uh, when they converge over a common network, the demand for infrastructure resources can, um, can vary widely. This means it can become challenging to size your network nodes. It becomes challenging to understand how um, large a scale um, you need to design your network for and what control plane capacity might be needed. So the network infrastructure, um, as a result, uh, over time may need refreshes in any one of the dimensions. I show on the left the chart showing, um, you know, uh, memory, signaling, and throughput kind of uh, KPIs. So any one of these metrics can cause um, exhausted capacity on a network node requiring uh, maybe a refresh of the network. <clears throat> Um, so, in, in the end, a flexible network architecture is needed to mitigate unplanned network upgrades as a result. So additionally, many service providers have embraced um, distribution or distributing functions closer to the end user for the purposes of improved latency, scale, and performance. <clears throat> Some examples of the functions include, you know, broadband network gateway or subscriber management functionality internet peering, content caches, gaming services, etc. As the edge functions move um, closer to the subscriber in more distributed locations, the number of edge nodes uh, or the number of managed nodes will shoot higher. And this can be you know, significantly higher where you might have had a, a centralized network node supporting many subscribers. Um, now you may have uh, 10 times that number of nodes supporting less end subscribers or end, end users, however, um, still, um, you know, needing to support all of the, all of the related functions. <clears throat> so the resulting consequence of this uh, distribution or this shift in architecture and distributing the edge is higher number of managed IP nodes, 
increased load on your BSS OSS systems, increased complexity with regard to IP address pool management. So you have more IP edge nodes, means you have smaller IP address pools to distribute across those more nodes, and uh, you know additional complexity across the network. So again, um, a flexible architecture, a network architecture to help mitigate these challenges is, um, is absolutely needed. Okay, now a little bit about um, architecture. So today, service providers have more choices than ever in terms of <clears throat> the deployment architectures um, at their disposal for you know, residential edge or BNG type functions. So the options are summarized in the four quadrants above, <clears throat> highlighting centralized versus distributed, as well as physical versus virtual options. Each of the architecture choices here offer their own set of benefits and trade-offs, particularly due to the implementation um, where control and user planes, you know, today are kind of tied at the hip and integrated and or need to be co-located at the same location. Um, this can cause, uh, you know, some limitations in terms of design and some trade-offs. So residential edge deployments uh, began <clears throat> as physical edge routers deployed at central locations. Increased bandwidth and, like, and video consumption, as well as low latency demands, um, drove the distribution of the functions closer to the subscriber. <clears throat> Virtualization was born as a, as a uh, technology driven from the desire to support service agility and scale out capabilities um, without having to purchase um, expensive oversized network nodes in order to future proof your network. Uh, an example, you know, if you, you purchase the node that was undersized from a control plane capacity perspective, it might be in, insufficient, you may need to refresh that network node um, for increased capacity unless you're leveraging technologies like virtualization where you have um, a nice scale-out solution. So that said, the optimal architecture um, to kind of uh, take advantage of most or all of the benefits across all four quadrants and ultimately provide the least amount of trade-offs while delivering maximum flexibility with best total cost of ownership, um, it would be ideal. So applying CUPS control user plane separation to a BNG goes a long way in, in achieving this particular goal. And we'll talk more about that in upcoming slides. Over to you, Heidi. All right. Yeah, I'm just going to hop in in a second. So this is an opportunity. I just want to reach out to the audience for a moment. We've got a quick poll question here. And as we as we, uh, sorry, this is going to be a live poll question. We'll see the results right away after we enter it in. Um, basically, what we're curious about is, you know, based on what you know today and based on the work you've done and based on where you're sitting, what do you see as the key drivers for change in broadband network gateway and or subscriber management architecture? So focus of our goal today, what are the, what are the key drivers from your perspective? So is it getting better agility to address bandwidth or subscriber growth? Are you really looking to drive down hardware costs? Are you looking to improve operational efficiencies, um, reduce OPEX costs as part of that equation? Um, perhaps it's evolution to 5G and looking towards multi-access edge, multi-access uh, and edge compute capabilities. Maybe this is sort of your, your driver inflection point. Perhaps you have a strategic corporate imperative to move that way. Um, or maybe there's other drivers. So take a moment, answer, pick as many as are appropriate. And I'll just give you a five, four, three, two, one, and let's see what the results from the survey are. All right. Ah, very interesting and very consistent with the research that we've done. Evolution to 5G as an inflection point and as a key driver for also pulling in change to BNG subscriber management architecture. So almost 70% of you saw this as a key driver. Um, number two, better agility to address bandwidth and or subscriber growth. So I do think as we look at CUPS and dig into it a little bit more, you'll see it does give you a lot more flexibility in terms of addressing 
having both capacity and or control plane demand and, uh, and being able to have more flexibility there. Okay, very interesting. Thank you very much, audience. Um, with that, we're going to move on to the next section. We're going to dig into the meat of cups and learn a little bit more about that. So to talk us through that, Sanjay from Nokia, over to you. Thanks, Heidi. Greetings, everyone. So as you've heard so far, there are diverse requirements being placed on the network by new broadband services and also this whole aspect of fixed mobile convergence. So when you look at a mix and breadth of these services, you need to you realize you need to balance between these requirements like ultra low latency, really high throughput, but also the large scale of endpoints that require connectivity. So it's a diverse set of requirements as well. And in order to meet these requirements, what we today see is a clear trend towards the architecture where you have very compact BNG edge nodes providing very high bandwidth being distributed closer to the subscribers, for example, to remote offices. But at the same time, operators want to also reduce operational complexity that comes with such large-scale distribution of complex BNG functions, right? So this is where, uh, you know, the disaggregation of BNG or control plane and user plane separation comes in, also referred to as CUPS. Uh, what does a control plane include? It is your typical subscriber signaling, DHCP, PPP, L2TP, but also basic subscriber management functions such as authentication, charging, interaction with your policy servers. And what does the data plane include? It's the basic forwarding element, but also traffic management functions such as, you know, QoS, usually enforced in hardware. So once you have separated or decoupled the control plane and user plane functions, you have the flexibility to independently and optimally place them as you need, right? That's one of the key benefits here. So the BNG user plane function can be placed in distributed locations, for example, where your content caches are, while the CP or the control plane can be virtualized and placed in a central uh, data center. So you don't need to really proliferate your control plane instances as you distribute your user plane functions on BNGs. And if you look at this model where you're centralizing the control plane, it would serve multiple distributed BNG user plane nodes, which means it's a one is to N relationship. And then the control plane and user plane can talk to each other over a standard interface. Uh, we'll cover more on that later. But the centralized control plane, the benefit is also it presents a single interface towards external servers, such as your AAA servers or PCRF or your OSS and BSS systems. So this clearly provides ease of operations, which is, which is important. But in order to really derive the benefits of this architecture, you need to follow certain design principles, uh, one of them being the control plane should be designed and deployed as a cloud-native network function that can easily scale up and scale out, but is also highly resilient. Uh, and then following a key cloud-native tenet, uh, you want to look at subscriber state or state of the subscribers being decoupled from the resources that provide your control plane processing, as I show in the slide here. So your subscriber state can live in a high performance database, whereas your control plane processing resources provide pure compute for signaling and subscriber management functions. So very important, decoupling subscriber state from control plane functions. And one of the key benefits of this uh, subscriber database separated and managed by a centralized control plane is to realize very simple and flexible, you know, one is to one or more cost effective N is to one user plane level or BNG level redundancy. So today in monolithic systems, you often see vendor specific state synchronization methods in use. Once you have centralized the subscriber state in a database, you get away from, you know, those models. So after a failure of a particular resource on the BNG, the state of the impacted subscribers can be accessed from the database and it can be created on the designated or selected standby BNG by this control plane. So, so really, you know, affording you very flexible and cost-effective redundancy mechanisms. Overall, another benefit of this architecture is that now that your control plane is decoupled, it can actually dynamically select your BNG user plane 
where the subscriber should be terminated. And it could do this based on any number of things, some of which could be available resources on a particular BNG user plane device, its utilization, also service capabilities of the, of the user plane. So the control plane, once it's separate and centralized, it can actually track the resources and capability of the user plane uh, devices, and then actually dynamically decide uh, where the subscriber should be terminated at the setup time, and then steer the subscriber's traffic appropriately to that BNG user plane device. Uh, yet another benefit uh, you can derive from this architecture is a more optimized uh, and more dynamic and operationally simple address pool management across a set of BNG UPs. So instead of pre-allocating you know, large pools to distributed BNGs, the central control plane can be configured, for instance, with a few large prefixes or address blocks. And then the control plane can dynamically assign smaller uh, you know, address spaces, call them micronets, from these larger prefixes automatically to a user plane device or to a set of ports on a user plane device. So basically the growth of your address space per UP can also be dynamic. So what it does is it takes away the burden for, from an operator to manage these address pools and also results in much more you know, optimal usage of this address space. So again, this architecture is a key enabler for this you know, on-demand management of your address space. Okay, moving along. So then uh, let's look at how the control plane and user plane talk to each other, right? So in order for control plane to create and program the forwarding state for the subscriber on the user plane, once the subscriber has been authenticated, uh, you know, that's where it needs a mechanism. So 3GPP, if you look at it as a standard organization, put quite some early effort on CUPS, specifically in release 14 of 3GPP. They provided CUPS for LTE and in release 15 for 5G. So as a result of this you know, industry-wide effort, they ended up standardizing the interface between control and user plane of a packet gateway, S gateway, and even a TDF uh, function. And this is the SX interface for LTE. For 5G, this is the N4 interface between SMF and UPF. So the 3GPP standardized PFCP as a protocol, or it's called Packet Forwarding Control Protocol. So 3GPP, as part of these interfaces, standardize actually a protocol. It's called Packet Forwarding Control Protocol. Uh, it is a custom-designed protocol for exchanging state between your control plane and user plane. It is really deployed in large Tier 1 mobile networks today. So it is field-hardened, very extensible, uh, as 3GPP has already uh, you know, demonstrated. And this is the protocol that is now also being standardized for BNG CUPS with very simple extensions. So what it does is it gives you a common protocol between fixed and mobile, it gives you engineering reuse, and gives you a nice baseline to start with. At the core of it, you know, PFCP is just a protocol that is used to manage the subscriber session state on the user plane and learn the per session usage information from the user plane. So session state, that the control plane can create on the user plane includes basically forwarding and traffic management state and actions. And I'll show an example in a bit. Uh, this protocol itself is reliable. It's a request response mechanism with retransmissions and message sequencing built in. Uh, another key point here is the protocol provides support for tunneling control plane messages that are received or sent to the you know, home RG or CPE between the user plane and control plane. So typically your, central, uh, your control plane is centralized in a data center, your user plane is distributed, there would be an intervening layer three network. So you need a way to tunnel your control plane messages from the user plane to the control plane and back. So the PFCP also provides this tunneling mechanism and it is GTPU or it's a, it's a encapsulation that it uses is GDPU. So what I'm also showing here in this slide, having done this separation, you should view this entire you know, system as a single CUPS system with a control plane and end user plane devices. So you still need, an operator still needs a way to manage those user plane devices, just like you have a CLI on a monolithic system. From the control plane, you still need a way to be able to gain visibility to all the user plane devices. 
So the control plane should support a local, you know, transactional CLI slash management for the entire CUP system by defining, you know, data models which are standard. So moving along, I just show here, uh, you know, a quick call flow with PFCP in action, a bit of detail. Uh, just bear with me here. So what I'm showing here is a home CPE on the left side. Let's say it does a DHCP to get its address. By default, this DHCP message is received on the user plane, uh, which is distributed. Uh, as with any fixed access, the signaling typically is in-band. That is, it comes on the same access circuit as a subsequent data packet. So it's the user plane device that receives this signaling message, and it then transparently tunnels the signaling message to the CP, as, as you see in this call flow. The control plane then authenticates the user, assigns an IP address, and offers it to the CPE. The CPE confirms this request for this address. At this point, the control plane turns around and it creates the forwarding state for the subscriber onto the user plane device using PFCP as a protocol. And basically, for any subsequent messages from your policy servers or radius to change service parameters such as bandwidth tiers, again, result in a message from control plane to the user plane using PFCP to update the traffic uh, management state or forwarding state for the user. So it's a very simple call flow if you see. You're getting your signaling messages on the control plane. It's doing authentication and address assignment. So all that is offloaded from the user plane and it's using a very simple, reliable protocol to create state on the user plane. And I also show the encapsulation, again, it's just detailed here on the right-hand side. So then, uh, having gone through that, let's look at a quick snapshot of standards activity. There is a fair bit of interest, and we have multiple SDOs, you know, uh, looking at the problem. We have had some early IETF drafts to capture just the basic requirements and architecture for BNG CUPS. Uh, subsequently, the Broadband Forum, because they have the expertise for BNG, they took over formally to look at the requirements as part of Working Text 459. And also to select a protocol between control and user plane for BNG CUPS. So they, they spent quite some time, did a very thorough evaluation, and formally selected PFCP as the only protocol between control and user plane, and now they are looking at extensions to the protocol for BNG. So all the industry effort is not, you know, so that it doesn't get fragmented. BBF decided to basically go with a single protocol here. And 3GPP, as mentioned, has been sort of the, you know, torch bearer where they started by standardizing this base 3GPP protocol. So quickly, iterating through or reiterating, I would say, and summarizing some of the key benefits of BNG CUPS. So the first is, of course, you get efficient operations by centralizing your control plane functions while distributing user plane functions so that you can optimize throughput, latency, your delivery cost, backhaul costs, and so on. Uh, it also then, a very important one, this decoupling makes it easier to manage the life cycle of control plane and user plane independently, right? So when you have to upgrade your control plane or data plane, you don't have to do these together. They can be decoupled as well, minimizing the impact on the network. Uh, of course, then, as uh, you know, Paul and Heidi both mentioned, you also get flexible scaling by allowing your control plane and user plane to be deployed on either physical or virtualized platforms, you know, depending on your case, whatever happens to be most optimal, and then you can scale their capacity independently as well. The last one, which is my personal favorite and is important, is that by separating this control and user plane and interfacing via a standard interface, what you're enabling is a way to operate heterogeneous user planes for fixed wireless access, for fixed access and wireless access under a common or a converged control plane. So this is then truly enabling fixed mobile convergence. Because now your control plane is separate, you can first converge it to work across both fixed and mobile, while your user plane can be purpose-built for either fixed or mobile. Lastly, since 3GPP mandates or requires control plane and user plane separation using PFCP, CUPS on BNG actually is paving the way for fixed wireless and hybrid access models, and we will cover this in quite some detail later. So with that, I would hand it 
over to Heidi for another poll. Excellent. Thank you, Sanjay. All right. So for the audience, you've heard, heard a little bit more about CUPS and CUPS in the BNG instance, what that looks like. Now we're kind of curious, so as you're looking at evaluating where you're going to upgrade to um, in your next upgrade cycle for BNG subscriber management, what are the models that you would be considering as part of that process? So will you be considering CUPS, BNG? implementations? Um, are you also going to continue to look at traditional integrated solutions? Or perhaps maybe still in the back of your mind you're still thinking they'll fully virtualize VBNG with both control and data plane virtualized as the path that you want to go on. Or maybe you've got some other considerations or maybe you're still decided. So select all that apply. And I'll give you five seconds here. And let's have a look and see what the results of our survey are. So for those of you who have responded, I guess no surprise you are attending a CUPS BNG webinar. Um, over 55% indicated yes, that is something you are going to be considering. Um, of note as well that fully virtualized VBNG solutions are still in consideration. So i it, not surprised to see that that's still in there. And also not surprised to see that the traditional integrated solutions are going down, although there is still interest in assessing that. And it looks like there's still lots of room to learn more. Uh, almost a third still undecided. All right, so with that, let's move on. We're now going to have a look at some deployment applications. So you've made this investment in separating your control and user plane. Um, what does that look like in terms of how um, the applications you can now look at deploying within your network? So to start us off, Paul, take us away. Okay, thank you, Heidi. Um, <clears throat> so this this uh, particular slide will cover kind of the uh, use case related to a wireline BNG cup scenario. And, um, you know, when we look at uh, some of these use cases, you know, you can envision with the BNG cups design, there are certain use cases which are more challenging in a non cups design or a traditional network design. So <clears throat> the key technology enabler here to enable kind of more advanced use cases is having um, a subscriber session database that's maintained by a central cloud native control plane. Um, with traditional network architectures, state information is generally distributed uh, across all the BNG routers, for example, and a given BNG has state information that is only local, is only relevant to locally anchored subscribers. So as a consequence of this approach, Vendors have had to support, you know, um, um, stateful synchronization designs and often non-standard implementations, which, um, you know, for for um, for these advanced use cases, which ended up preventing uh, market adoption, especially with multi-vendor deployments. <clears throat> so maintaining an aggregated and centralized subscriber session database, highly resilient and cloud-native. Is, an inherent, uh, is inherent to the CUPS design. So the control plane builds and stores state information on behalf of all of its downstream user planes, and um, that state information is centralized, and it you know, uh, simplifies the ability to support more advanced use cases. So some of the advanced use cases you can envision with the CUPS design that is more challenging with a non-CUPS design are listed here. I'll just cover a couple of them. Actually, Sanjay touched on a couple already. The first one is, is related to an intelligent um, service placement. So maybe you're, you think about your user planes in your network. They're highly distributed across the network. Some user planes may be more capable than other user planes. So this capability exchange is understood by the central control plane. And, um, you know, for example, uh, distributed BNG user plane may support basic subscriber termination for internet services, but another user plane may support more advanced services like URL filtering or parental control, for example. So subscribers that need parental control could be steered through the control, through the control plane to a more capable user plane in the network that's capable of L7 processing and delivering upon that um, parental control use case. <clears throat> So with CUPS, the central control understands the capabilities of its user planes and can trigger the required steering. So that's kind of the intelligent um, service steering or service placement use case. 
Um, I think we touched on the user plane redundancy a bit already. The other one is, you know, deploying user planes as a pool of resources or load balancing across them. So maybe you, you have smaller user planes and you want to rack and stack these. You can treat them as one logical pool of BNG resources and um, have the controller monitor the fill rates of each of these user planes and uh, provide some balanced level of load balancing to kind of minimize any kind of blast zone, uh, any kind of um, you know, failure scenario to, to mitigate your blast zone uh, impact. So <clears throat> the other one I'll just touch upon is uh, centralized IP address pool management. Uh, Sanjay talked a bit about it and uh, you know, the importance of having it being centralized is if you, as you distribute more, your address pools get smaller and smaller, having a central uh, awareness of the pool utilization uh, allows you to do uh, more efficient utilization across your network. Um, and if you extend that a bit, um, leveraging you know, telemetry streaming, you can understand um, thresholds associated with pool utilization across your BNG resources and employ automation so that if um, a given user plane is about to reach capacity, maybe it's 90 percent uh, of his addresses are utilized, um, you could automate the provisioning of uh, adding an address pool and another address block to that um, linked to the existing um, address pool. So this would allow, you know, kind of uh, automation to uh, prevent manual interruption of the network. Um, I think I'll go to the next slide here. The next, um, <clears throat> the next uh, set of use cases is related to fixed wireless access. So fixed wireless access actually opens a uh, new use case and market opportunity for service providers. It's viewed by some service providers as kind of a stepping stone towards full um, 5G wireline wireless convergence. <clears throat> and um, it's used to, you know, augment or replace the last mile connectivity, the copper or fiber last mile connectivity to the, to the home or the small medium business. Um, <clears throat> it's also, uh, you know, the role is it extends the reach for broadband services to new customers where, you know, the wireline last mile might not exist or placing fiber in the ground may not be practical. <clears throat> Um, as shown in the chart in the upper right here, um, a fiber to the home scenario can carry, you know, a higher capex cost, you know, for the last mile fiber, the digging, trenching, all that fun stuff. But it also uh, can introduce complexities with regard to um, getting local approvals um, and right of ways to dig the fiber in the first place. <clears throat> and, the idea is once you have the fiber in place, you know, you're, you need uh, reasonable take rates. So when you're doing your, um, your market research, you know, you need to, you wouldn't lay the fiber unless you had a reasonable probability of your take rates there. So additionally, um, you know, service providers <clears throat> need to compete uh, with some of these newcomers. So there are all these newcomers that are showing up that are starting to deliver fixed wireless access. So some of the established service providers need to watch and compete against these guys that are using, you know, both licensed and unlicensed spectrum. Uh, examples include Starry and Common Networks, uh, for example. So the high-level use cases around um, fixed wireless access, uh, I'll quickly run through. So the, the first one is around nomadic or temporary, um, uh, temporary service which is, uh, you know, live stadium events where you may be going in there and doing a live streaming event or um, <clears throat> seasonal demand like ski resorts is another uh, use case for that one. Um, remote IoT is another interesting use case where fixed wireless access can be used to provide broadband connectivity to smart farming IoT devices that might be measuring, um, you know, important KPIs like humidity, temperature, soil moisture, for example. Um, dual access connectivity is another one where you have uh, enterprise business or high-end consumer that's looking for a backup service to their wireline um, connection. So if the wireline connection fails, um, then they have the fixed wireless access service as a backup. 
And then the last one is uh, called walkout walking, which is basically um, a fixed wire, uh, a fiber to the home example where fixed wireless access provides faster time to revenue for the service provider, where the broadband service is offered day one while the fiber is being installed or approvals are happening uh, in the neighborhood. Okay, on to you, Sanjay. Okay, hey, thanks, Paul. So for sure, uh, fixed wireless access is giving operators an option to uh, you know, increase their broadband services footprint. We see operators today trialing 5G millimeter wave as an alternative to fiber to the home, as Paul alluded. Uh, we also see operators who are trying to use sub-6 gigahertz, including CBRS, to provide you know, off-franchise offerings or rural broadband access, again, to increase their footprint. Uh, but here, even though the access is fixed wireless, the service characteristics are that of a fixed service. For instance, high-speed broadband, voice, and you know, IPTV. So, why would you use BNG here? One, because the service is uh, the same, similar to what a fixed access service is. But also, operators want to use your existing, you know, subscriber management and service provisioning on BNGs that they have invested in for fixed wireless, so it's an easier reuse, uh, reuse for them. Uh, besides, there's no true mobility here. The sessions are typically high-throughput, long-lived sessions. Uh, so, I mean, it's a clear driver you want to do this on the BNG. Now, what does this entail on the BNG? So for LTE or 5G non-standalone access, the BNG needs to act like a combined S gateway plus P gateway function in terms of signaling and data plane supporting your 3GPP interfaces, for instance, S11 interface with MME, and S1U or GDP, which is GDPU, to your e -Node Bs. So your entire IP address assignment, traffic management, and service delivery for fixed wireless subscribers can happen on the BNG. And in this case, the BNG also provides your 3GPP cost parameters to the RAN. Now, as Paul said, this fixed wireless access can then further be evolved to hybrid access, where the CPE can have both a fixed and a fixed wireless connection from, uh, to, the, to the BNG. And the motivation here is, of course, resilient connectivity, but also hybrid access can be used to provide higher aggregate bandwidth. For instance, some operators want to use this to deliver IPTV to rural subscribers where they don't upgrade from, let's say, copper to fiber. Uh, and, of course, the other use case is fast turn-up of your broadband service before your fixed broadband connection is in place. In this hybrid access model, the BNG can bond these two connections together and actually provide a single IP address, and then flexibly it can distribute your traffic flows over both connections, or maybe use fixed wireless connection only when the fixed connection is saturated up to a certain threshold. So these are like some of the real use cases which are driving fixed mobile convergence. It's no longer you know, a check mark uh, in, a, in an RFP, but it's enabling real you know, value-added services here for the, for the operator. So moving along, another key driver for uh, fixed mobile convergence is to provide these fixed broadband services via common converged 5G core. So here the operators can then use their 5G core that they're heavily investing in for both fixed and mobile access. The so benefit is that a common 5G infrastructure can be used for you know, authentication, registration, session management, and the whole service delivery. Uh, what this entails is a mediation gateway function, which we call as access gateway function. It is being defined in BBF, and this is actually required to adapt your fixed access onto a 5G core. Uh, so AGF is a simple device which basically relays you know, 5G signaling. If your RG or home CP is 5G capable, it takes that 5G signaling and basically relays it to your 5G core, in this case an AMF, uh, which used to be MME in LTE world. And then if it's a fixed RG which you haven't upgraded to 5G, the AGF just proxies or originates the 5G signaling on behalf of the fixed RG. So also in this model, the service delivery itself moves to the 5G core, where your BNG is now an SMF and a UPF, so it's split session management and user plane function, but the beauty here is your current BNG can evolve to provide your 5G UPF as well as an AGF function. So then taking a step further, 
uh, if you look at it, uh, you know, you can realize a common converged SMF which can provide control plane for fixed, fixed wireless, and pure mobile 4G, 5G access. The UPFs can, of course, be different. For example, UPF for fixed access can be your current BNGs. So again, uh, you know, key FMC uh, requirement is, you know, using a common 5G core. And again, CUPS plays in a part here because all this 3GPP is already factored in this decomposition of these functions. Uh, over to Heidi, or is it? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So um, we'll quickly give each one of our sponsors maybe 60 seconds to talk through a summary of their approach. So starting off, Sanjay, with you, give us a little overview okay. on Nokia. Time starts now. Okay, so uh, I'm, ho I'm hoping most of you are aware Nokia has a market-leading BNG, very well entrenched. Uh, it is available both as a physical network function, which is our SR of, or service router platform, 7x50, and uh, as a VNF, which is our virtual services router. That's where we call this any platform. No religion. We give you the flexibility to either be, use it as a PNF or a VNF. The subscriber management functions themselves are implemented as modular building blocks. So besides fixed access, these can also be used for fixed wireless and hybrid access like I talked before. So that's where BNG is becoming a multi-access gateway that works for both wired and wireless access, and that's where the notion of any access comes in here. Uh, also, like I said, uh, we are evolving to support broadband integration with 5G core by supporting AGF on your current you know, BNG platforms, uh, for instance, and SR. Uh, therefore, I mean, if you look at it, BNG is a multi-access gateway that works both for wired and wireless, but it is also enabling service delivery using a common 5G core infrastructure by providing both AGF and 5G UPF. So in that sense, it is, uh, you know, any function that I list here on the slide. And lastly, Nokia is unique in that we are providing a converged 5G SMF providing control plane for fixed access, fixed wireless access, and 4G, 5G mobile access. So in short, you get full investment protection with your current Nokia BNGs as you look at multi-access and fixed mobile convergence uh, with CUPS being an enabling factor. Uh, I think I'm All done right. here and I stayed within my time. <laughs> Thank you, Sanjay. Paul, would you like to do a few words on Juniper's approach? That was 30 seconds over, Sanjay. Um, okay, so <clears throat> a little bit on Juniper. So Juniper continues to execute on a uh, service provider strategy that includes, um, you know, wireline and 5G convergence. Um, our strategy is grounded by the premise that the following key technologies are fundamental to the true to true network transformation: automation, applying cloud and cloud principles, and end-to-end -end security. These technologies are going to be leveraged as part of Juniper's BNG evolution, as well as our 5G fixed mobile convergence solutions moving forward. <clears throat> um, as network architectures evolve towards disaggregation in cloud, security and automation will play a more and even more critical role in their success. Um, <clears throat> in addition to uh, committing to a standards-based BNG CUPS implementation based on uh, the standards that we talked about today, Juniper has taken um, an open ecosystem approach with regard to our fixed mobile convergence strategy. That means our user planes, whether it be fixed wireless access, SAE gateway, future AGF, we will interoperate with any mobile vendor's standards-based mobile control plane. So uh, summarizing Juniper's uh, service provider strategy, we'll deliver network solutions incorporating key technologies around automation, cloud, and end-to-end -end security, we will provide investment protection and smooth migration, leveraging our MX platform from wireline BNG to fixed wireless access and beyond to 5G convergence. We'll offer flexible choice of um, physical and virtual uh, functions as well as hosting environments for BNG as well as the mobile user and control plane functions. And we offer an open ecosystem to mobile core control plane vendors. 
Awesome. Thank you, Paul. So with that, uh, just a quick reminder, we'll have time for a couple of questions. If you have any, please enter them in the interface and we will follow up with those of you who have asked questions if we don't get a chance to address them today. Um, so to wrap up the session, a couple of key takeaways. First and foremost, uh, you know, network transformation is underway. Um, CAPS is seen as a, as a, a go-forward path for enabling broadband edge mobile core evolution convergence, um, opens up a lot of interesting opportunities. Um, some of the benefits of the approach, as we heard on the webinar today, include simplified operations, maintenance, and a flexible, uh, flexible scaling, and a path towards fixed mobile convergence, and, and different takes on what that can look like. And finally, we also heard um, the wide range of potential use cases where CUPS can be used and can enable new types of services. So we've seen use cases in the wireline BNG context. We looked at fixed wireless access. We talked about some hybrid type services and of course that integration with the 5G core moving forward. So as you look at all of this, um, as we can see from our sponsors today, the technology, the standards, the approaches are maturing, the tools are available today, and key vendors are you know, ready and willing um, to start engaging and developing these architectures. So with that, I'd like to move over to Q&A. We only have a couple of minutes, so I'll put a couple of questions out and we'll see how we go. Um, first off, I'll, I'll throw one to Sanjay. It's a little bit of a higher level question. So we touched on a lot of different use cases. Um, um, from what you've been seeing in customer engagements, what do you think are the initial use cases or the ones that you believe operators are most interested in out of the gate? Yeah, so this whole aspect of uh, decoupling where you can independently place, uh, where you can distribute your BNGs while uh, operationally making it uh, easier, that is definitely one. Also, this whole dynamic selection of BNG based on resources or service types. And then we are very strongly now hearing conversations on fixed mobile convergence on the largest tier one operators, both telcos and cable, are looking at CUPS in order to enable fixed mobile convergence. Fixed wireless being one of the key drivers there. All right, and Paul, if I was to ask you the same question, are you seeing similar things or are you seeing a few different use cases emerge with the customers that you're engaged with? No, I would say uh, very similar to the use cases that Sanjay just mentioned. All right. Um, let, me, uh, let me have a... Just come back to the standards. So one of the things you guys highlighted with some of the work that's underway with the broadband form with respect to completing the specifications for the interface um, for the BNG cups. Um, actually, Paul, maybe do you have some insight on when you anticipate the broadband form will complete the specifications? Yeah, sure. So I think, um, you know, Sanjay can chime in too because he's very heavily engaged, but um, so is Juniper. The, the, basically, the, uh, the bulk of the work for B&G Cups is targeted to complete by the end of 2019 with uh, publication targeting um, um, Q1 2020. Um, okay. So this would, include, this would include PFCP extensions um, that are needed to, for, the, for, the, for the wireline BNG use case. Okay, and I, and I think uh, just a question for Sanjay related to this. I think uh, pretty much covered, but we did, you did indicate PFCP seems to be the approach going forward. Just kind of curious if other interfaces like maybe OpenFlow or OpenConfig, you know, were those considered as well? What was the decision made to go forward with PFCP? Yes, so both 3GPP and BBF looked at uh, other approaches too. I um, mean, the fact that you want to start with something which leads you to convergence was one of the most important determining factor. And the protocol over time, PFCP, has proven to be extensible. It started with LTE packet gateways, moving to S gateways, moving to TDF, and then 5G SMF UPF. Uh, so BBF took a strong, uh, you know, look at options, and then for the reasons I mentioned, you know, enabling convergence, engineering re reuse on vendor side, less of a learning curve for operators because this is already a field hardened protocol, kind of tipped the balance in favor favor of PFCP. Plus, it's fundamentally designed to exchange state between control plane user plane from ground up. 
So that that is another reason, right? It's not reusing something uh, which was built for something else, but we are trying to force fit it. No, this is kind of ground up, custom built for this this kind of application. All right, I'm going to throw one last question, and there's a few questions that kind of tied around this. So with CUPS, you have flexibility in terms of how you want to implement your control plane and how you want to implement the user plane. Um, I guess the question would be, maybe one question is, on the user plane, um, do we anticipate seeing a mix of virtualized user plane and uh, hardware-based or traditional user plane? And likewise on the control plane, um, are we anticipating that the control plane function is going to be in the cloud? You know, like where are you seeing the implementations for those two functions lying? So Sanjay, maybe to you and then Paul, if you have anything to add on to that. Sure, sure. So for user plane, again, like we said, uh, any platform, we do see we do see both deployments. It could be based on service. It could be based on where you want to locate. So absolutely, uh, both are being accounted for. Now, today, if you look at largely the landscape is where your data plane devices are purpose-built hardware devices uh, from key vendors, but there has been some traction on, on a virtual, you know, x86-based implementation as well. Control plane, uh, by and large, once you go to this decoupled architecture, makes sense to be virtual, cloud-native, which you can scale up, scale out, highly resilient. So that we do see is, uh, is a server-based implementation with, you know, cloud-native design principles adopted. Paul, would you say that's fairly consistent with what you're anticipating as well? Yeah, definitely. I'll just make an, a, an additional comment on the user plane side. So control plane, absolutely in alignment. Um, you know, we believe cloud native containers will be um, hosting uh, the control plane for the most part. On the user plane side, you know, we, we do see a hybrid of physical and virtual. Um, I think, you know, depending on the a specific use case you're trying to achieve, for the physical user plane implementations, you know, there may be some percentage, like 10% of the users might be heavy hitter type users. So this is where kind of a hardware offload might come into play. Excellent. All right. Thank you both. Thank you to the audience. And with that, uh, we'll wrap up today. Alan, handing back over to you. Thank you, Heidi. And I also want to thank Paul and Sanjay for sharing your expertise with us today. And of course, for Heidi for leading our discussion. Thank you so very much. Uh, the on-demand version of this webinar will be made available shortly. So feel free to come back, view this session again, or even pass it along to your colleagues. You will see a short survey pop up at the conclusion of our webinar. So please take a few moments to fill that out. And finally, continue to follow us on Twitter and LinkedIn for information on future webinars from IHS Market Technology, now a part of InformaTech. So again, thank you for joining us and have a great rest of your day.